You found the Backup Wrap Up, your go to podcast for all things backup, recovery, and cyber recovery. In this episode, we explore how to design your backups to make them more resilient to ransomware. We'll discuss the importance of understanding dwell time, the need for longer retention periods, and the value of frequent backups. We'll also delve into innovative recovery solutions, including the use of snapshots, replication, and cloud-based solutions. We also talk about the difference between database and file system recoveries with regards to ransomware. We get down in the nitty gritty this week. I hope you like the episode. By the way, if you don't know who I am, I'm W. Curtis Presson, AKA Mr. Backup. And I've been passionate about backup and recovery for over 30 years, ever since I had to tell my boss that we had no backups of this database that was really important that we just deleted. I don't want that to happen to you, and that's why I do this show. On this podcast, we turn unappreciated backup admins into cyber recovery heroes. This is the Backup Wrap-Up. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, W. Curtis Preston, a.k.a. Mr. Backup. And before we get started, if I could please ask, please like, share, subscribe, so you never miss a beat when it comes to this show. Did, did, did that give you joy? <laughs> I mean, it's been a while since I've done it. You know that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I get to introduce you now after you've introduced me, and I'm going to introduce you as my fall post-traumatic stress counselor, Prasanna <laughs> Maliandi. How's it going, Prasanna? I'm good, Curtis. How are you feeling, by the way? I, you know, I, I think th those that watch on YouTube, right? You, you can watch this on the Backup Wrap Up channel on YouTube. Those that watch on YouTube can see there. There's no. Uh, th this is where I would have. On the left side of my face, I would have expected a shiner. Uh, I don't have any broken bones, and I, I just have a little bit of soreness left. What are we talking about? Yeah. Well, well, before we talk about what yeah. happened, yeah. for those people who may not know, a shiner is not someone who shines shoes. <laughs> a shiner is sort of when someone punches you and you get like a black eye around. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. like a bruise. I would have expected a shiner, yeah. So I kind of happened, fell, Curtis. Yeah, I kind of fell down an entire flight of stairs. Oh, um, Curtis. By the way, this we can we can blame the new office on this. Um, or we can blame this on the new office. It's because I'm spending more time upstairs now. Um, yeah, I was literally it happened like 20 feet to the left of me, and I was on a ladder. And I, the, there's a hall next to a landing. And I, when I came down from the ladder, my right foot came down on the hall. My left foot came down on the landing, and which was about, you know, it's a stair, a stair tread less. So that's like, what, six inches. And, and that was all the momentum. I, I completely lost my balance and I gained forward momentum going straight down the stairs. So I fell down face first. I didn't ball up like you might typically do when you fall. Yeah. Because I, I was worried that I would then tumble down the stairs and I just knew I would break everything. I think, yeah, if you had tumbled down, it probably would have been a lot worse. Like head yeah. over heels. Yeah. And so I stiffed up, stiffened, stiffened up and then put my hands out to brace my fall because I fell 90 plus 45, right? So 135 yeah. degrees, right? I was standing it's straight up. like a tree up, going then, down. Except yeah, like a tree going no down, but, but there's no crowd. And so I fell face first on the stairs, put my hands out, managed to stop, you know, whatever. And then I slid face first all the way to the bottom of the stairs. My face, this is why I said I was expecting a shiner. My left side of my face hit the ground first, and then there was enough momentum that I kept going. And then my daughter made me go to the emergency room and I had a whole bunch Which of extra rays and a CAT scan. And uh, yeah, you know, and you're almost 60 years old and you fall down an entire flight of stairs. 
you don't really get a choice. You go to the ER. Well, and, and, and I think you should tell people what the doctor said to you when he came up to you to check on you. <laughs> Yeah, he walks. Actually, ev- pretty much every medical professional, like as they turned around the corner and then they saw me and they were like, are you, are you William? Because that's my first name for those. Of, that's what the W stands for. Uh, are you William? And I'm like, yes. And they're like, you're the guy that fell down a flight of stairs. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, I was kind of expecting blood and guts and <laughs> you know extruding Broken bone bones and, and yeah, yeah yeah he's like you look fine i'm like i know and they made me come anyway um and so they were yeah so they did a cat scan they did you know i don't know probably like 15 x-rays of my arms because they were they were all you know whatnot and uh and then you know sent me home and they they asked me if i wanted any pain medicine and I, I literally said no, because I remember the last time I was in the ER when I broke my nose, for those longtime fans of the show may remember that, um, I, I, they said they said they'd give me something for the pain. They gave me like a Tylenol and like the lowest level like narcotic painkiller you can give. And they charged me $800 for that. So I was like, I'm good. I, I'll, I'll suck it up. Um, I got a fifth of tequila somewhere in the house (laughs) (laughs) or some edibles, maybe some edibles. Um, but yeah, so it was, um, but I'm glad to see you're okay. Yeah. 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 Amazingly no major injuries. I've got some sore spots, you know, but no major injuries. So the podcast shall continue. (laughs) Our series on ransomware shall continue. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're taking a break with Mike this week, um, and we're going to talk about specifically the backup side of things. We've already done an episode or two that I will summarize as follows. Your backup server is, is at risk, right? It's at high risk, actually. Yeah, it is, it is at high risk. And, and, and there are, we have numerous... Um, data points to back that up. My favorite, I think, what did Dwayne say? And what, first of all, what, who was Dwayne and what, what, what did he say? Yeah. Dwayne is a red teamer, right? So he pretends to be the bad guy in attack systems. Yeah. And I think he basically said, I love the backup system. That's the first system I target because yeah. I get access to that. I get access to all your data in your environment yeah. because everyone backs up into a single place. It's the keys to the kingdom. <laughs> yeah. So if a red teamer thinks that, and by the way, if you haven't heard the red team episode, go back maybe two At months. Yeah. Uh, there's an episode called, uh, you know, about red team. And he, he clarified that, you know, it, both the backup system itself in terms of how powerful it is, how much you get access to it. And also in terms of how poorly it often is designed mm-hmm. from a security standpoint, he talked about things like service accounts, right? He said he loves the, the backup service account. Uh, do you remember what he said about default? that? With the default password? Yeah, no yeah. Password. Yep. But do you remember what he said about what was unique about it? Yeah, with the backup service account, nothing gets logged in the system <laughs> when just... you access it using the backup service account because it assumes you're going to be using it all the time and reading everything in the file system. So yeah. why bother logging anything? Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, that I think that was an episode where we just said, listen, you really need to understand your backup server is at risk. We also had an episode or two where we talked about how to design the server itself um, in order to better insulate it from that risk. Do you remember the kinds of things we talked about there? Yeah, I think these were ideas such as segmentation. It mm-hmm. also included don't have your backup server connected to your normal active directory instance, kind of keep it isolated, separate. Um, Make sure you're just also the normal stuff, right? Like make sure you patch your systems, including the server up to date on those. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So all the, the usual stuff of, um, you know, obviously patch management, password management and MFA, obviously. Right. Yes. I think the big one that you mentioned that I, harp on a lot is to separate it as much as possible. Don't have it on the active directory domain. Don't have it. Um, you know, don't use the same username and password there that you use anywhere else. Um, 
I mean, that should be true anyway, but whatever. This is a practice you should have everywhere, but you should definitely have it here. And that is don't ever log in as root or administrator, log in as you and become root or administrator. You use the concept of least privilege so that you can uh, minimize the damage that any one person could do. One I wanted to add there, because I know we've talked about this on episodes a while ago, is don't save your password to access your backup management system in your web browser. Yeah, please don't do that. <laughs> please don't do that. Um, the and, and, and we're we're big proponents of password management here, and and, and specifically password management systems, not your browser. Uh, again, the browser is better than nothing, perhaps, perhaps not in this yes. case. The thing that that I remember when we talked about third party password managers. It floored me the first time I installed Dashlane and it said, hey, should we go get the passwords that you stored in your browser for you? And I'm like, wait, you can just get them? <laughs> they're, yep. they're not like encrypted or anything. You can just ask the browser, hey, what's the password you have for this? And they just sucked them out of there. Well, it's encrypted, but it probably just has API access. So as long as you granted yeah. API access. Yeah, yeah. But if, um, if you can get access by APIs, any other system, software yeah. running on your system yeah. can also. Yeah. So so some sort, some sort of third-party password management system. And I do believe that it should be a different password management system than the rest of the world. Again, segregate, 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 right? As much as possible. Obviously, more than any other server, shut down any services that you don't need, especially mm -hmm. my favorite, the ransomware deployment protocol. Um <laughs> Otherwise party. known as Windows RDP, for right. those who, don't, right. who may not recognize that acronym. Um, and um, but today I wanted to talk about how do we um, design the backups themselves uh, to be more useful in times of ransomware, right? Probably the first thing you need to do is actually do backups. <laughs> right that should be like your step one of your strategy you know, i live in this i live in this <laughs> fantasy world persona where like I, everybody does backups right actually just before this recording i was on another you know uh, another thing and 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 i realized that i'm speaking to lay people in this particular recording uh people in the legal profession and i was asked like what is a backup and what is a restore? And it's like, and, and I know that, you know, they're, they're catering to an audience that doesn't understand this yep. stuff, but I just live in this world where everybody backs up their stuff. Yeah. Right. That's uh, why you need the idiot in the room, i.e. me. <laughs> exactly. Everybody runs a third party backup of their iPhone because they know that iCloud is not a backup. Yep. iCloud is not a backup. iCloud is a synchronization product, mm -hmm. uh, not a backup product. Go listen to that episode if you're interested. Yeah, go listen to the how to properly backup your iPhone. When we think about designing a backup system for the purposes of, of uh, responding to a ransomware attack and then being able to recover, I think it's important to think about um, a, a lot of things in terms of how does ransomware typically behave? How does a ransomware response event typically take place? And so I, I think the first thing to talk about is this concept of dwell time. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So I think a lot of, and if you go back and listen to some of the previous episodes, and if, if you look, listen to what Mike has talked about before, I think everyone thinks, oh, I got hit with ransomware. I just got infected. And then boom, just that next instance, everything in my environment is encrypted. Yeah. Right. That's what I think a lot of people think about it. It's almost, but it's not how that works. It's like you get infected by a disease, right? It might take you a day before you start to get like a cold. And then maybe a couple days later, you start to spike a fever, right? And so similarly for ransomware, we talk about something called a dwell time, which is how long is the ransomware actually in your environment, even though it may not be actively encrypting data, right, right, or exfiltrating data or whatever it is, but it's already got a foothold in your environment and it's exists yeah. somewhere in your network. 
<laughs> yeah, and and I think it's important to understand again, and we've talked about this on other episodes that. Remember that ransomware isn't a single piece of software, right? Yeah. Um, maybe the actual ransomware is a single piece of software, but the entire, there, there is a suite of tools that ransomware actors are going to be using to, to get, number one, to get into your environment, number two, to spread around in your environment and to figure out what's going on in your environment. And that it's that final uh, yeah. tool, the one that you're, you know, the actual ransomware tool that's doing the, the uh, encryption and or doing extraction, right? Doing um, exfiltration. exfiltration. Yeah. But before that happens, you're right. There is this, this process of like going through the network and figuring out what is, um, you know, figuring out what they can do. There was a great story that Mike talked about where he said that they were in an environment and they were doing a... Um, they did a tabletop and during that tabletop, they used the incident response plan and they obviously shared the incident response plan around everywhere. And what they found out was they got a, they got a ransomware attack right after this. And what they found out was that, um, that they had already been attacked and that the attacker was in their system for quite a while. And so he got to see the, you know, the, the, uh, what do you call it? The incident response plan and all the stuff. And they got to see like how much insurance they had and all the stuff. Right. Uh, so that, that's a really big time. And so what's the concern when we start talking about restoring? Well, I was just going to mention, like, I know this has come up in the past, but one of the banks that I bank with, that's a credit union, they were hit with ransomware that basically over the 4th of July, that shut down everything. Mm -hmm. Right. But they finally published a, a analysis of what happened. And they say that, so July 4th or July 1st is when everything got shut down. Everything mm -hmm. was encrypted. Right. They said that they were in their network starting May 23rd. So six weeks, almost. That would be the, that would be the dwell time. Right. Yeah. And if you look, if you do some Googling, you'll find that the average dwell time is actually really long, right? Um, like the mean dwell time last time I looked was like close to 90 days, yeah. uh, which means that there's ones that are way <laughs> beyond yeah. that, right? Um, because, it's not like they're all 90 like days and it works out that way. Yeah. Because I think for these actors, right, there are two things they want to do. One, they want to spread everywhere so they have access to as much as possible. And two, they want to figure out what's valuable in your environment. Yeah. Right? They and wanna, so they, they want to be make, in there as long as they can. Yeah. Yeah. And so if they go in and immediately start encrypting, right, using the ransomware, you're going to notice and now they've lost that opportunity. So it's kind of a balance right. on their side, right? They want to be in there spreading, observing, but the longer they're in there, then the more likely it is for them to be detected as well. So it's kind of this balance. Yeah, it is a balance. Um, but the longer they're in there, the bigger the possible reward. The other yep. thing that they could do, and there, there's a couple things that they could do while they're in there a long time. One is they could start encrypt encrypting. And again, this is one where I'm going to describe what I've been told has happened. I haven't verified this, but it seems reasonable to me. And that is that they start encrypting stuff that nobody's looking at. Like the old right? stuff. Like older data that nobody's yeah. looking at. And um, they do that because they can, they can do it and get away with it because nobody's looking. Uh, number one. The other thing, what do, you, what do you think is the other thing that they could potentially do if they're in your system for a long time? Exfiltrating data. Exfiltrating data, right. More than likely, you will end up paying the ransom, um, even though I hate the idea and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. But it's a very different argument of like, oh, no, I don't have to pay the ransom. I, I got good backups and a DR plan and it's a response plan. And they're like, yeah, but we stole all your data. We're going to tell everybody what you did. Um, the longer they're in there, the easier exfiltration is, right? Because they can do it slower. They can you know, send it out, which, again, is why I continue to say, please figure out which some way to track which, outgoing traffic. Yeah, which is actually what happened at this credit union. They ended up exfiltrating data from their database in addition to encrypting everything. So yeah. social security numbers. Are they back addresses. up, by the way? 
that credit union? Uh, yeah, I think they are back up. Uh, last month, they had to send out paper statements because they weren't fully up and running. But I believe now they are up and running. But all customer data is out there on the dark web. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> Because, uh, again, fans of the podcast may remember that uh, my medical uh, group got attacked with ransomware in May. And I found out last week they're still not fully up and running. Wow. Yeah. Did they, maybe um, they don't have backups, Curtis, is what I'm guessing. I, I don't even want to know. Um, all I know is that for months, the only way I could make an appointment was to go into... I get, I had to physically drive into the doctor's office, which luckily for me is like 15 minutes from my office. Yeah. Uh, I could go, you know, drive there, make an appointment. And it was, it was actually kind of good because it meant it was a pain to make an appointment, which meant that it was easy to make an appointment. Is that, you understand <laughs> what I'm saying? Yeah. It, was lo- it was logistically difficult to make an appointment, which made it easier to make an appointment once you were there because yep. no one wanted to deal with many it. people. Yeah. No one wanted to deal with it. Right. Uh, but yeah, what I found out again, this is just last week that the phone part of the system is still not back up and running. That's um, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Com- completely crazy. What's worse is it pre- it's pretending that it's up and running. I called the number. I waited on hold for like 20 minutes and they're like, you know, press one, you know, to, if you're a provider, press one, if you're a patient, press two. And if you want to speak to, you want to make an appointment, press two. Okay. And, and then it's like, for the Chula Vista office, press one. For the Encinitas office, press two. You know, and I'm like eight. Like I'm, like I'm yeah. with the, you know, and then I finally press eight. And then it's like, please hold. And then da, 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 and it was like, it was like 20 minutes later, click. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? Uh, so I was like, well, if I didn't know, first off, I didn't know it was going to take so long. I would just, drop, I would just, I would just drove yeah. over there. Let alone if I'd have known, maybe, you know, maybe I should have done is got on the phone and then, dr- and then drove and then drove there. Yeah. So anyway, so I made my appointment um, and, and then, and then proceeded to fall down the stairs. Um, all right. So if there's a long dwell time, what do we need to be talking about with regards to um, backups? Backups. Well, so when you are getting to the point of, recovering from your ransomware incident, you want to make sure that the data you're restoring is clean, right? That it doesn't contain any bits and pieces of the ransomware, right? right? Or any of those other intrusions that have happened in the past. So you really want to find a clean point. So it doesn't sort of restart itself and you end up deploying the ransomware again. So how would that affect... How would a long dwell time affect the design of your backup system? You need a longer retention because you need to make sure your backup is a clean backup before you got infected. I say this because it's very common. And again, I, I had a conversation with Mike about that. It's very common for people to say, oh, well, I only need 90 days. Right. I only need 90 days for my my backup retention. And I understand the reasonings behind that. Right. Um, And uh, and and Mike was saying that it's very common. He's seen it in the field where people go to restore their stuff and the retention period of their backups is less than the dwell time of the product. And they're unable to successfully restore. I have a question about this, though. Yeah. Yeah. So I totally get it. Ideally, you want a clean backup. But mm-hmm. if you go, say, you have to go back three months, right? Yeah. So you restore from something from three months, and now you have to sort of roll forward yeah. to get back to the current point in time. Yeah, that's my the next question, thing to talk about. <laughs> yeah. My question, though, is, is that better than restoring a non-clean backup and then surgically going and cleaning it up? Yeah. So... Th- that's a really good question. Uh, let's finish this point okay. and then let's go to that point. So all I'm saying is you, you know, to have options, you yeah. need a much longer restore, uh, a much longer retention period than 90 days. Um, but- my, my general thing would be like a year, right? Yeah. Like a minimum of a year. I would actually, I would say for a business minimum of, of 13 months, because sometimes you want stuff from like the annual report from a year ago. Yeah. 
Um, I don't see any problem with going c- a couple of years in your retention. You know, I don't want you to go much longer than that. I was going to say, don't consider this an archive. Don't right. use your backups right. for archiving. But yeah. Yes. Um, but the, you know, th- there, there's nothing wrong with having a couple of years retention for your backups, maybe even three years, right? Now, that's not really a ransomware defense at that point. Um, but you want options, okay? Um, what, so my, Mike and I spent a, a quite a bit of time talking about this, this issue of clean versus, you know, completely clean versus clean versus cleaning it. <laughs> Does that make sense, right? Yeah. So he, he explained a, a couple of things. One, and, and it, the, 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 I'll just say, this is a complicated question. Oh yeah. And it's, and it's more complicated when we start talking about file servers. Mm -hmm. So first off, let's just, let's just do the, 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 you know, good, better, best, right? The, the best, when you ask someone that's responsible for that, that has been through this, they will tell you that the best thing you can do is a complete wipe and restore afterwards yep. a, a complete wipe and a restore, especially when we're talking about the system, yeah. right? The OS um, that start from a clean slate, right? Start from a clean slate. Okay. Because there, there's two different things here. There's restoring the systems and then there's restoring the applications. Yeah. There's actually three. And then there's restoring the sort data. of just di- like unstructured data. Right. Yeah. So regarding the systems, uh, he feels pretty strongly that this should be a, a clean wipe install. It is and- possible. It is possible to do what you're talking about, where you restore the the system, and you and you're able to find you know you find out what variant of ransomware you have, you find out what tools that variant installs, you uninstall those tools. The concern with a something. <laughs> restore and you, yeah, but not just that, but you, the big thing is, did it install something like in the boot block Yeah. to basically re-enable, you know, now if and, and, you can also fix that, right? Yeah. Well, and I think this is some of the challenges today too. I don't know if you saw, but there's a new malware variant that injects itself in the UEFI boot right? Which is literally baked into the motherboards, right? That's supposed to be super secure. And so in cases like that, you're basically hosed, right? (laughs) You don't even want to restore that data because it's always going to, like you said, it always keep coming back over and over, no matter what you do. You you know what? I'm going to pull a persona. What? Persona. You just used an acronym. What is (laughs) UEFI? I know what it is. I just, I just realized I have absolutely no idea what that stands for. But well, first off, what is a UF, UEFI boot? What are you talking about? So UEFI boot is how the system boots up based on... So in the past, right, you had the master boot record and it had sort right. of certain blocks where it knew where to go in order to load it. In order to make things larger because there were certain limitations and also more secure, like Windows and other things use what they call a UEFI mode in order to be able to boot your operating system. Stands for Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. So it's basically the, it's the next generation. It's been that way for a long time, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, you know, it's been a long time since MBR was that master boot record. The MBR yeah. <laughs> was the only <laughs> option, but yeah. So this is just what I'm talking about. I, I guess again, and this is why I'm, you know, I'm such a fan of having an expert in the room. This is why you bring in somebody like Black Swan Security, right, uh, to, to to come in, which is my Mike's company. But the, the but to go back to the design issue, there are two things that you want to make sure you have, right? Well, I'm going to say three things, but two things that you want to make sure you have is you know the retention period and also a high enough frequency yeah. that you know you have again you have options what does frequency when we talk about there's a couple of 
couple of acronyms that we we actually we actually haven't said it in a while. You know what else RTO we haven't said and RPO? In a while? Yeah, RTO and RPO. Which one? You know what what else we haven't said in a while? What the three two one rule? Three two one. The three two <laughs> hasn't come up in a while. We've been talking about ransomware so much we haven't talked enough about backup. But so when we talk about RTO and RPO, right? Recovery time objective. That's how fast you can you you you, you want to be able to restore. And then recovery point objective, how much data you're allowed to lose. Yep. So frequency is going to impact which of those? RPO. Yeah. And RTO, technically. Potentially. Depending. Depends, right? If you okay, have to yeah, go I guess you're, I guess you're right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it, I, I think maybe like levels and things yeah. combined yeah. with frequency might yeah. affect, affect your RTO. So um, it's just so funny. Like I've spent so much time in this new world where we don't do levels, right? Yeah. We just do one full and the incrementals forever, which is the way all backups should be done. But whatever, I digress. <laughs> um, the um, I, I really do think the concept of like repeated fulls is really a, a concept. Go ahead, by the way, yeah, yeah. But um, so you want to make sure you have a long enough um, retention period. You want to make sure you have a frequent enough backup. Uh, and then what I want to talk about, this is this is my third thing that I'm tacking on the end of my two things. And that is you need options during a restore because when you're, uh, when I asked Mike to sort of walk through what a, what he felt was like a typical restore scenario and what he described was many, many restores of the same system that then allowed you to pick apart to say, okay, do you know we want to restore this version? Yep. Nope, that one's infected. We want to restore this Go one backwards. No, that's yep. infected, and keep going backwards until you get to a system that is clean. not infected, right? That's yep. clean. If you didn't build that into your design, a ransomware recovery is going to take significantly longer. Yep. Now, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a freebie. What design element? that's backup related, Test could you be using that would allow you to have infinite recovery points without- Deduplication. No, sorry, you fail. Inf Let me finish my sentence. Allow you to have virtually unlimited recovery points and while in R with RTOs of like next to zero. <sighs> Do I have to answer this? I don't like this answer. I know what it is. It's, what is it? It's three letters. Oh, <laughs> no, wait. Oh, no, wait. no, not not infinite. Sorry, not an infinite number of recovery points. Ne nearly, nearly. Infinite. So, uh, so, so, okay. So let me, let me check. So in my mind, as you're describing this, I'm thinking of CDP, which is continuous data protection. Yeah, that would be infinite. Okay. Uh, there is also snapshot-based replication. Oh! Okay. <laughs> so it only took me two tries, which isn't bad. <laughs> so I gave you I gave you a leading question, but I guess I didn't lead you enough. <laughs> I just I thought that you know given your background this would just just yeah. jump right out but maybe maybe they beat you out of it enough yeah. at your pre yeah. previous employer so this is where snapshots and what I would call near CDP right near continuous data protection this is where snapshots can be so useful yeah because how how I don't, you tell me persona how else can you restore hundreds of versions of the same server without much pain? You can't. Unless every copy or every backup was on a separate tape device or tape, and you had infinite number of tapes connected <laughs> to infinite number of devices. Right, right. right? So you could do the restores in parallel. Basically, the equivalent. And by the way, of like that's so you can cluster. restore one server a hundred different yeah. ways. Yeah. And then you've got a hundred other servers. Yep. So yeah, you would need infinite, 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 infinite. Yeah. I, I guess what I'm saying here is think about this, right? Think about 
Um, and this is where, uh, and again, we, we get into more storage here than backup, but you, you know that I'm a fan of this, this concept of snapshots and replication. And that if we think about like, there, there's a lot of technology that allows you to store your virtualization world. And I'm a big fan of virtualization, store your virtualization world on, on a filer, right? Yep. That allows you to take snapshots and replicate those snapshots and replicate them even to an immutable uh, device yep. if you want, right? And then you have yep. infinite number of recovery points. Yep. Um, I, I guess and I'm saying- I, I, I want to add know, one more thing on top of it. Okay, sure. I think deduplication becomes important because everything you're talking about right now is for a single server. But now say you have a hundred servers that are all based on like a similar image or whatever else. I think deduplication, I, I think deduplication can add a lot of value in terms of it can really help reduce yeah. the amount storage of storage that's going to be used. Yes. Um, I don't think it's required in terms it, it's just going to save you money. Right. But the idea of, I guess I just, this is where, uh, you know, this, this is one of the, this, this is why I'm such a fan of, you know, not just NetApp. NetApp's not the only one. There's so many companies and it's not yeah. just filers. It's not just NAS. It's, there are also SAN devices. There are iSCSI devices. There are modern scale out storage arrays that have infinite or, you know, short, yep. short or close to infinite number yep. of snapshots that don't impact performance. And that, would offer you um, some real choices here. Yeah. I, I think also we can throw in the concept of copy data management. There are, yep. there are CDM products like, is it still called Actifio after it got acquired? I think it's still called Actifio. Yep. Yeah. So products like that, basically, I guess what I'm just saying is this is a real problem, right? This is a huge problem. And this is a, potential really useful tool towards this problem. Maybe it won't solve all known, you know, things, but when we start talking about, uh, Hey, I want to do a hundred copy, you know, I want to keep retention for this long and I want, I want to potentially restore my server a hundred times and I, but I don't want to restore my server a hundred times. Yep. Um, it just seems like, Snapshots and replication would really be your friend here. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I don't see how else you're going to be able to even figure out if a copy is clean. Right. Right. Without something like this. So, and, and this is, you know, the, a, another, so I'll, I'll throw this here. Another possible friend is the cloud. Yeah. Right. If you are using a cloud-based recovery system, and if that recovery system has the ability to scale out and say, I want to recover, bang, 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 right? Yep. It's just that all the ones that I've seen, at least the ones that I've seen, you know, essentially with my own eyes, when we start talking about recovering many, many copies, they can scale it out, right? So they, so they, they do. You know, you remember earlier when you said if you had a, a infinite tape drives and infinite, yeah. all that, they have that. The cloud lets you do that, yeah. To the some cloud extent, cloud lets you do that, right? But uh, the restore of the actual server will still take a finite amount of time, right? Yeah. And again, build that into the design. Figure that out. Go to the vendor. Say, hey, here's what we want to do. We want to be able to do restore the server a hundred times and pick which one we want. Can I do that? Well, yeah, it's going to take you three years. You know, figure, yeah. have that discussion now. You know, build that into the design. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm just really, and and maybe this means you change vendors, yep. right? Maybe this means you change storage systems, um, or maybe you talk to your vendor and see how do I solve this. Here's yeah. my challenge. Well, Here's you, you definitely should do that first. You know, I'm a fan yeah. of, I, I'm not a fan of like, uh, rip and replace, uh, steeplechase. I call it right? not a fan of just going, you know, place to place just to, you know, I always think you should, you should let your current, you know, give your current vendor the problem 
don't go to them with the design, right? Yeah. Go to them with to your requirements, this is, right? Yeah. This yeah. is what I'm looking to do. What's yeah. the best way to do that? Yeah. I, because maybe they know, have listen, a mechanism that you haven't even thought about. Yeah. I listen to this podcast and Curtis said, I need to be able to restore my server a hundred times. Like, how, how do I do that? Is there a way to do that with your product? Right. Um, or, well, actually, technically, what what you, you would say, I need to be able to identify you know, a clean copy. identify a clean yeah. image and so maybe yeah. there's a way to do that um yeah, yeah I, the the example i always give for dictating the requirements and not the design i live in san diego and we have coronado which is it's not an island but people call it coronado island um <laughs> it's coronado peninsula but that doesn't sound as cool and i always give the example of, of, of say listen i need a hundred thousand people to be able to go to and from that island every day that's a that is a requirement yeah. And maybe it's a tunnel, maybe it's a ferry, maybe it's a care. bridge. Right? Or in the case of San Diego, maybe it's all three. <laughs> Not a tunnel, but we do have a bridge, we have a ferry, and we have the long way. The long way yep. uh it's funny in San Diego, really you can long. literally see Coronado. Yeah. It's like right there. It's like a half a mile on the other side of the water. But the long way without the bridge is like for like a 40 minute drive. <laughs> Cuz you got to go to Mexico. No kidding. Yeah. You got to go to Mexico, turn around and come back. Um, Maybe yeah. you could just swim anyway, across. <laughs> you could just swim across. Anyway, I think that I think that was good. It was a good yeah. conversation. We did not talk about two things, though, that okay. you had brought up earlier. The one is you had talked about restoring the server, but not the databases or the yeah. application yeah. and the unstructured yeah. data. I don't know if you yeah, want to cover yeah, yeah, that yeah. quickly. Yeah. So... All right. So a couple of things that we didn't talk about, right? Uh, this idea of restoring the server and perhaps restoring the data later. I, I'm thinking mainly about the idea of like using an image perhaps to restore the server. And then mm -hmm. we restore the, and th that image would probably have a clean copy of Oracle or whatever yeah. it is that you want to restore. And then potentially restoring the data as a secondary thing. I, I think this is another potential way to do this. And by the way, virtualization makes all this <laughs> so much easier, right? Yeah. Um, but which is, you know, on the list of why I, I'm such a fan of virtualization. But that is a potential, again, just look at these designs and then and then work with it. When we look at that method of doing it, the I think this is a much more valid method for restoring, say, databases today because I say this, you know, I'm recording this on August 21st, 2024. Today, they don't tend to attack databases directly, meaning they don't go into the database and, and mess up the individual contents. If they encrypt the database, they encrypt the database file. Yeah. Right. So you just want to restore, you want to restore the database. Yes, you restore the file. You restore the file from before it was encrypted. You're good to go. Yeah. Right. Generally speaking. So I think that's a really valid way to restore a database server and an application server that has mm -hmm. something like a database on it. The, the real concern I do have is when we start talking about unstructured data and file systems, because what did we start this, what did we start this podcast talking about? You remember the phrase that we defined in the beginning? The dwell time? So, so what, why is having a long dwell time? It's like, Hey, I get, you said 90 days, right? I got, I got, I got six months. I got, it's, I got a year. Yeah. Curtis said to do two years. I'm doing two years. I got two years of backups. So what if the dwell time is 90 days? What's the problem? Well, well, because you, because it is going to go through and like we talked about, right? It might decide I'm going to start with the old data and slowly start encrypting things. And maybe you notice, maybe you don't notice, but. Now you have to go figure out, like, I need a a haystack, except the haystack is a small number of files in, say, a billion or five billion files. So the good news is there's going to be one of two scenarios, and most likely you're going to be the first of the two scenarios. The good news is I think most of the time you're going to look at the server, you're going to look at the even unstructured data, and you will be able to easily identify which files were encrypted and you're going to find that they were all encrypted at the same time. They were all encrypted all on the same day. 
I think that this idea, again, August 21st, 2024, <laughs> I think this idea of slowly encrypting the files over time, one, one of two things. I think it is, at, at a minimum, it is more rare than the other method. Because again, the moment they start encrypting files, they really set off alarms, yeah. right? So I think it's pretty rare. And I even think it's possibly a boogeyman. I, I, I don't know for sure. But if you have this problem, though, there's no good answer. Uh, you know, that, well, the, the, the only one there, that there I'm is. aware of, right, there was, you know, from from our previous employer, they had a solution to this problem where they, 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 they had this, they called like image curation, right? Where you could give them a range of time, they go, and they would go in and automatically pick the last good version of every file prior to it being encrypted. Doing that manually, if you have this slow encryption, doing that manually is, is yeah. you know. And then, and then you just need to think, if it's all the old data it's encrypting, do I really care about it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the, um, take it, um, again, I'm going back to 100 years ago when we had this uh, this old server that we were decommissioning and it had been around so long that nobody knew what was on it. Mm. And so basically we got down to like the final one or two servers that were part of it. It was a, it was AT&T's first attempt at a multi-processing computer. Right. Okay. And so it had multiple computers inside the computer. And so we got down to like the last one or two. And basically the, the idea was uh, we just turn it off and then see who yells. <laughs> Sometimes that works the best. because we couldn't figure out, you know, we couldn't figure out who was on it and what it was doing. And so that's the same kind of thing. Like, you know, if a, if a file gets encrypted and nobody reads it, did it really get encrypted? <laughs> it's like, if, you know, like if a tree falls in a forest, falls in forest. <laughs> if a oh, file gets crap. attacked by ransomware and nobody wants the file, who gives a crap? Uh, that's our, that's our, uh, that's our there final piece of advice. <laughs> All right. Well, this, this has been fun. I think it's good. Yeah. You, again, it's this is a little bit more far-reaching in terms of some of the design elements and design ideas that you would put in there. Um, but I think it's one that, that people should really be thinking about. Yeah. And this isn't intended to be a, a conclusive list, right? Yeah. But this is just initial thoughts to get you thinking. And go have your discussions with other experts, with your vendors right? To see what else you should be thinking about. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thanks, Persona. This was fun. I know this was fun. And Curtis, I'm glad you didn't die. Because then I would be <laughs> sad. <laughs> what, one final thing on that, because uh, I don't think I mentioned it earlier. You know, we, we, we have some people that are renting, uh, renting a room from us here. And he, he happened to be the only one that was home when this happened. And he heard it happen. And he was very glad to hear me yell out his name because he's like, he was scared to go out. He, he was like, he heard it happen and it sounded awful. And he's yeah. like, I, I hope he's not dead. Yeah. And then he heard me yell out his name and he's like, oh, thank God. He's, thank he's God. not dead. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm not dead too, Persona, mm -hmm. so that we can continue. I'm sure our listeners are as well. Yeah, I they don't care. <laughs> All right. If there's anybody out there that's glad I'm not dead and they're still listening, send me a note on backupwrapup.com. <laughs> send a message. This uh, I'm glad you're not dead. Or put it as a comment on the uh on the YouTube video. Or a comment on the, you know, on the uh on the, on the backup podcast. Wrap up. Anyway. Yeah. Well, uh thanks to our listeners. Uh, you know, we kid, but we love you. You're the only reason we do this. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, just a couple of guys just talking. <laughs> Uh, and we'd probably just talk about barbecue then. So that is a wrap. The Backup Wrap-Up is written, recorded, and produced by me, W. Curtis Preston. If you need backup or DR consulting, content generation, or expert witness work, check out BackupCentral.com. You can also find links from my O'Reilly books on the same website. Remember, this is an independent podcast, and any opinions that you hear are those of the speaker and not necessarily an employer. Thanks for listening.